Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Connie Chang. I'm the commissioner for ANC 3G05. I welcome you to tonight's um, ANC 34G Fall 2021 Information Exchange Series. This is session number two. Uh, we are uh, here to learn about uh, the perspectives of some of our apartment residents here in Chevy Chase, D.C. And um, I will introduce them in turn in a second. But I wanted to make sure that um, I give a little bit of a background to the series. Um, it, it started with us uh, hoping that we can involve the community more in this Chevy Chase small area plan planning process, uh, which began um, with a public launch in March. And there were several different um, engagements that the Office of Planning put together. And the ANC uh, wanted to make sure that other topics that they didn't cover, that we would cover, and that we would um, play a, a role in uh, gathering people and getting input and um, answering some questions and bringing experts to the table. So this session is to bring you the voices of a few apartment dwellers uh, who live on Connecticut Avenue in three different apartment buildings and they'll introduce themselves and you'll know which ones. Um, and uh, the following sessions, we had a first session that uh, was last week uh, on small area plans in general, you know, what, uh, what, what's best practice, you know, what things that we should look for and things to avoid and that Commissioner Gosselin put together uh, with Jeff Farner, who's from the city of Alexandria. And that, the link to that video recording, if you missed it, is on our ANC website. And um, I think I have that in the chat so you can go there and you can look. Um, uh, coming up after tonight are three more Thursdays in October, the 7th, 14th, and 21st. Uh, right now, the 14th, uh, we will have a um, community land trust experts. And so, Lisa, you can unmute yourself and say a few words, but the flyer will come out. So I want you to be able to say that, and then I'm going to go right back to um, the rest of the of the series. Yep. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Gore, and I'm the commissioner with ANC 34G01. Um, I cover Hawthorne and Barnaby Woods. It's great to have the three panelists with us tonight. Um, and just to let everyone know, on the 14th, uh, we will have some um, presentation on community land trust. And our presenters are going to be from Douglas Community Land Trust, which I'm extremely excited about. Douglas has a great history in our city and um, also they're working with Southwest to do uh, community to land trust in that area. So they're gonna talk to us about possibility of just, you know, basically an overall history of the community land trust model and how we could potentially finance something like that here in Chevy Chase. So I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gore. Um, and then we will have a nonprofit panel coming up and then uh, some other ones, but those are not firmed up yet. And as they firm up, we will have flyers out um, posted on our website and social media, uh, listservs and so forth. Um, so we hope you can join us, but just mark your calendar for the next three Thursdays in October. Um, thank you so much. Um, I am going to start by saying that uh, we have panelists and commissioners as panelists. Uh, everyone else is in the audience. Uh, please, if you have comments, put it in the chat. If you have questions for the panelists, please add them in the Q&A. I will read them out later. Um, if there's time, I will definitely, uh, I could elevate you as a panelist if there's something that you would like to share um, and say, uh, we can discuss that as we go. Um, but tonight I want to welcome Christina Svensson, um, and Maria Sims and Eric Spencer. And I would like Eric to go first. He um, lives in DC, but he's in New York City. Uh, he was supposed to come back, but they, they kept him there. So he is calling in from New York and he's a trooper uh, for, for joining us. Um, and so he's gonna give you um, a little bit of his background and who he is and how long he's been here. And, um, and then just briefly, and then we'll go to uh, Christina and then we'll go to Maria. And after that, I'll ask a few more questions. I hope to go until about 7.35 and then maybe a little earlier than that and then open up for Q&A. Thank you so much. Eric, would you like to go? <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone, and, and thanks for having me. Um, as Connie said, my name is Eric Spencer and I've, I'm originally from West Virginia. I've been living in Washington, D.C. since 2011. I really lived over in Northeast DC, but um, I'm part of the inclusionary housing program. So when the building 5333 5333 Connecticut got built, 
they had some affordable apartments, um, one and two bedrooms. So I qualified for a one bedroom with a den. And I've been in Chevy Chase at that place since 2016. And the building itself, I heard that it was a lot of controversy surrounding the building. But the building, it's really nice. It's really diverse. We actually have a lot of young families, families with, with children, um, school age children, middle school, elementary school, and high school. Um, it's, it's, it's been a good experience for me up in Chevy Chase. I, I, like, I like the way that it's set up, um, real homely. So I, I, I'll leave it there so we can, uh, we'll probably get to the Q and A's, but that's just me in a nutshell. Okay, and Christina, would you like to share some of your story? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, my name is Christina Svensson. I'm um, a single mother of two teens on a limited income, and I live in the Garfield, which is on Connecticut and Legation. And um, I've been here, I've been in DC three years, and I came immediately to the Garfield. Previously, I lived in Europe for 30 years um, in cities like Paris and London. Um, so I'm kind of a big city person. And um, the Chevy Chase has been really great for uh, my children. Um, yeah, they've kind of arrived when they were about 12. And I think it's a really great neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of advantages. Um, at the same time, I'm excited to hear how the neighborhood can pull together and make it even more welcoming and maybe a little bit more vibrant and offer some things that I think, you know, on the, on Connecticut that we're all looking for a little bit extra. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you so much, um, Maria. Hi, my name's Maria Sims and I've been living in my apartment for over 20 years. I am a single parent. I raised my son in, in that apartment. I live in the Lorraine on the corner of Legation in Connecticut. I think that throughout the years, it's been a great place to raise my son, especially as a single parent. And I look forward to us building up. I mean, I've seen us come up and down as people you know, pass away and younger people move in and then their kids move out. And so I've seen a juggling of the community. And I think we're at a point now where I see a lot of you know, strollers. So I think the community is definitely moving back up to having children around. So I look forward to seeing them grow up and talk to me as they get older, you know, like we did a few years ago, I guess 10 years ago, when I had the up and down. So I guess I'm looking forward to see the kids grow up again. Thank you so much. Um, Eric, I want to go back to you. Um, I would like you to share uh, how, did, how, how did that whole lottery system work? and um and a little bit more of your background okay yeah i forgot to mention i am a single father i have two daughters one uh, works out in silicon valley she's an astrophysicist and my other daughter she just graduated with a degree in biology she's studying for the i think the medical exam but um the lottery itself it's, it's, it's a program called the inclusionary housing for the district of columbia um affordable housing program great program as, as, as with a lot of DC programs. And you have to take a, a two hour course, it's orientation. And then after the orientation, you get a certificate. And whenever new affordable units come, like when they build all these new buildings, including 5333, a percentage of the houses is affordable under the inclusionary zoning. So you, you, your name goes in the lottery, they pick 10 families for each unit. And then the family that's at the top they are the first one to get, if they, if they don't want the apartment, then it just goes down like that. So I happen to be lottery. I happen to be the number one family on the list. So I was able to get into it, into the apartment. Me and my, me and my daughter that's the astrophysicist, she stayed with me for several years and she really, really liked it up in, up in the whole area, up in the Chevy Chase area. She loved it. Great. And did she go to the local schools uh, here, Eric? No, no. She, she she once she went off to college, she came down here. She went to Michigan oh. State, and she's from Detroit, Michigan. Okay. And she moved down here with me because she liked it, the building so much. She said, "Well, Dad, I just want to come down 
to stay with you in the area. She liked it, the fact that it was um real convenient in terms of the metros and things of that nature, you know, stores, because she likes to get out and walk. So it was real walk friendly. Okay, thank you so much for um, telling us how you how you were able to get your apartment here. That's that's a very compelling story. Um, Maria, I didn't get a ch I don't think we got a chance to hear that you're a native Washingtonian. Maybe you can share a little bit about your background a little bit more and um, and the reason for you moving here, coming here to Chevy Chase, DC. Well, I'm, I'm a native Washingtonian. I was raised in um, the Georgetown area and um, I actually ended up going to school at Wilson, which is also the same high school my son graduated from because I was right in the middle of where Western turned into Duke Ellington. And so right in doing that point, I couldn't go to Western because there was no Western. So I ended up having to get bused over to Wilson. Um, I also went to American University. So I've been in this area for a little while. Uh, one of my first jobs was working up at Lafayette at Lab. So I'm really connected to this area. But one of the reasons why I did move in here is because I wanted my son to go to Lafayette. And so that would drove me over here to this area. Right. Originally. And you said that and you said that he went to Lafayette, then switched to Merch and then went through yeah, to went Deal to Lafayette, and, and Wilson. Right? Merch, yeah. So he actually graduated from Merch and Deal and Wilson. Okay. Wonderful. Um, and and Christina, do you want to share some of the experiences you've had before living here and why you chose uh, Chevy Chase DC? Um, yeah, sure. So my family's um, from Europe. And I grew up in San Francisco, but when I was a teenager, I moved to Europe and lived in a bunch of different cities, um, most of the time in Paris. Um, I got divorced and I had my two kids and my brother has lived in DC for, uh, I think over 25 years now. And he's been in Chevy Chase, I wanna say almost 10 years. So um, when we arrived, we stayed with him and Obviously, I had no idea about DC and I thought, well, maybe we should stay in the same neighborhood for like convenience. And obviously it's really beautiful. And the school that we, it was Alice Deal, my girls were gonna go to Alice Deal. So it made sense. And then I found this apartment in an ad um, on the internet and it was an incredible price. And even today, like, it's hard because we have, we're in a two bedroom and I've got two teenagers. <laughs> they're both, yeah, they're girls, but you know, they don't wanna really hang out with each other too much. So I, I'd say we, what we did was um, we were lucky in our apartment. There was like an alcove for a dining room. So we kind of made it a, a three bedroom by putting up um, bookshelves and plywood and wallpapering it and stuff like that. So. It's not perfect, but um, it works. Um, and I think we'd like to move into a three bedroom, um, but it's it's not really affordable. And I, I feel a bit spoiled in, in the Garfield because the standards are really high. Um, and I, I can't find anything in DC that's really competitive with, with, with what we have right now. And also my girls are really, well integrated into the schools and all of that is going well. Um, so I think, yeah, I, for us, I think it's very convenient, but it's just far enough that it's calm, you know, and it's green, it's a really beautiful neighborhood. So it's, I find it, um, like Eric said, just walking around in the neighborhood, um, it does us a lot of good because it's just, beautiful and there's lots of trees and it's greenery. So that's that's kind of where we are. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Eric, I did talk to you about life in, in 5333. And would you like to share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's very diverse. And, and what I like about it, you know, is we have, we have families. So, you know, we have the, the, the young kids running around, um, the apartments, they're they're okay, they're they're nice, and the amenities, I think, is what draws a lot of people there. Like on the rooftop, we have grills, so you know people grill year round. Like it could be winter time, if we got grass grills, because we have like 
when, when I say I'm up on my rooftop, most people think I'm outside, but it's glass enclosed. So I can, I can hang out on the inside. We have TVs and like a pool table. Then I can walk right outside 10 feet. And there are the grills right there. So I can walk in and out. They have a, um, they have a, a, a gym and then they have a, like a little space where they have yoga. They have different activities. They have Zumba, they have yoga. So it's, 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 it's bustling. And then we have college students. Um, that's, that's a plus, you know, cause you, you know, I, I, I want to be in a, I like to be in a situation where there's a, there's a, a wide range of people, you know, our elders, our middle age, our, our, our college students, our middle schoolers and our elementary, you know, so that's what keeps, I think that's what keeps the, the building itself vibrant. It's, it's a, pr a pretty cool building. Well, when I had to come to New York, they had a movie night. You know, where they have like a movie, they show a movie outside on the, it's like the Zen Garden, and Zen Garden, I'm sorry. And they have pop and families come out. And sometimes, you know, uh, people that live in the building, they have, they have like little functions. So it's pretty cool. We got a swimming pool as well. So it, 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 it's, it's nice. Thank you so much. And for those of you who may have joined us past seven o'clock, um, Eric is in New York City in a car and, and he had a business there, but he's still joining us. So his um, his Wi-Fi might be a little tricky, but I want you to know that this is this is the reason. Um, uh, I, this I, is important I, enough for him to come and show up. So thank you so much. Absolutely. I had to talk yes. to at risk youth today. Yes, he was talking to some at risk youths in New York City. So thank you so much. I'm gonna go they, back to- I was supposed to come back, yeah. Right, you're supposed to come back in time for this and be um, sort of like uh, Maria, like you know, and Christina in your own apartment. Uh, Maria, can you can you? Um, I, I, there are some questions that I'm going to get to in the Q and A. A lot of people are very interested, but I do want to ask you: um, You are a native Washingtonian. Why? Why not just why Chevy Chase? Which is because you said your son want you wanted your son to go to Lafayette. But how did you find um, the apartment in Lorraine? You're, you're muted, so. About that. Um, one of the people that I work with, an IT specialist that I was working with at the time, she lived in the building and she was always taking me and Eric home. And she was like, oh, you guys got to get an apartment in here. I can't keep driving you home every night. So we next time apartment was available, we moved in. Okay. And you also said that the people who uh, live there um, can you can you can you tell us a little bit more about like the couples who live there with one children and then as they grow their family, what is the experience? Yeah. We don't they don't stay as long as Eric and I have. You know, even my friend when her daughters got older, they moved out and got into a house in Virginia. I mean, first of all, we don't have three bedroom apartments, so it's really hard if you have a mixture of kids, a, a male and female child, and then as they get older, they just also believe that the cost. And then you can also get a house for what you pay for rent also drives people out as well. So I do want to talk about um, housing options. Um, what are, I think, Christina, you have a pretty strong view. So I, I'd like to go to you about that. Um, sort of the availability of housing here um, and the diversity of housing. Um, you talked yeah. a little bit and maybe you could expand on that. Um, so I think, well, when I first moved to DC and my sister-in-law said to me, it's going to be hard to find a three bedroom. It just really doesn't exist. And it was a bit strange to me because in like in Europe, there's three and four, there's a lot. I mean, it's an older place, you know, it's like these older buildings and they're much kind of the apartments are bigger. It's a different architecture. But I was really surprised and I thought that can't be right. Maybe they're in the other neighborhoods. And, you know, I'm kind of looking almost every month, kind of trying to understand where could I find three bedrooms? Is there something I'm missing in Chevy Chase? Are there opportunities there that look interesting? Should I figure out how to buy something? Is there anything that I can buy? Um, so I've studied the question but I think, um, as Maria said, there aren't any three bedrooms. I think there's a couple buildings that might have a two or three. I think there's some that are further down on Connecticut that have um, kind of closer to Cleveland Park. I think that they have um, 
quite a few three bedrooms. Um, a lot of those aren't for rent, they're for sale. So for me, coming from San Francisco, the other thing that I think about a lot is um, in-laws. What we call in San Francisco, the Bay Area is in-law apartments. So when the housing crisis uh, came about in the Bay Area, a lot of people did have big yards and so forth. So I think even it was like 30, 40 years ago, and also because of the universities, people would build a small house of one or two bedrooms in their backyard, or they would develop their garage, they would make it two level. And so that was a really great way of either having an older member of the family near you, but not, you know, in the house. But it, it was really for Cal Berkeley and universities, it was a great way to, to provide affordable housing. Um, a lot of the people were older and they liked having someone on the property and developing this relationship. So um, I think I lived in a lot of cities, so I've seen a lot of different ways that cities try to come up with solutions. And it's really tricky because you have each city has its own culture and the architecture and so forth. But I think it would be really great. There are, DC is filled with families and families are really important for the future of a city. You know, like I think someone brought up in a discussion a while back that um, when you have say all millennials who are highly educated professionals working in a city, it's gonna bump the rents up, right? Naturally. So I think like Eric was saying, it's so great to live in a neighborhood that's got this variety of generations because really that's how life is. And when we're, it's a true community, right? And it's really healthy to have older people watching the younger people grow up and that pleasure, but also for the younger people to have interactions with older people and understand, well, how do I communicate with this person? You know, it's those interactions that that really bring a lot of richness to our life. So you that's you, the trick. You bring up a really good point because when when I spoke to Maria and she said a lot of families in Lorraine have had to leave when their family expanded. And um, I know that um, the Office of Planning, when um, they looked at the existing conditions and so forth of our area, it looks like it's definitely young families and older people. So I'm very concerned about this middle group. Uh, are, are they leaving for other places? And Maria, you have experience as the president of your tenants association. How many would you say that you know of in your 20 years of living there do you think have left when they could have stayed? Oh, I, I say at least um, 20 to 30 families have left over the years of me being here. You know, and every now and then I may see them on the bus and they say, you remember who I am? And I was like, oh my God, he's so big now. But yeah, they've come and gone since then. And also um, we have a lot of people that are passing away too. So some of our old people are switching up too, that they're just not here anymore. And when I came here, you know, they pretty much had grown, grown up into this apartment, their parents left and then they took over and now they're going away too. So we've had in the last five years, we had a lot of deaths in our um, building. Yes, you mentioned that. Um, I, I'd like to, it's it's 724. I'm just going to move to one Q&A, which I think is it's in this part um, that I want to stick with and then move on. Um, the, the question is, could any of these panelists afford to live in this area if not for the apartment buildings? So just a yes or a no. Um, uh, Maria, since you're unmuted, you go first. No, I don't think so. How about not you, Eric? purchasing a house. Not purchasing a house. How about you, Eric? Uh, could you have, could you oh. afford to live in this area if not for the apartment buildings? No. And Christina, I think you sort of answered it already, but. No, no. I, I've tried to do the calculations, like how much income would I need in order to buy even the smallest house um, here? And I just don't, understand how I would reach that income level. I, I don't know what I would need to do. Um, it's really tricky as a single mom. 
you know, we've got a lot of pressure and to make that a commitment to that type of job, which today requires so many hours. It's not a 40, we, you, it's not a 40 hours a week job. So I've calculated carefully and I just, I can't see um, how that would ever happen if I wasn't in an apartment building with two bedrooms. And you um, also said to me that you know a lot of other single mothers with children in the neighborhood. Would you like to share um, yeah. a little bit about that? So um, I actually did a project for the Garfield and um, it involved me meeting uh, almost everyone in the building, almost mm -hmm. seeing, looking at almost every apartment. And um, I found that a really deep experience, very emotional because I was invited into these people's homes to take a few technical measurements. Um, I was surprised how many families were living in one bedrooms. Um, they had bunk beds um, and like one large bed um, or they had, um, you know, a, a, what do you call them? The, the beds, um, the sofa bed. They had a sofa bed and then they had the kids in the bedroom. Um, there was quite a few. And um, I would say not, not all of them are maybe comfortable um, to speak up because English is not their first language. But I mean, these are really impressive families. Their homes are so, um, they really take care of their homes. And you can see the love that they have for the children, whether it's the grandparents taking care of the kids or, you know, a single mom. Um, I think a few of the single moms have um, gotten remarried and moved out. Um, but some of these families, I think they're going to be here a very, very, I think they're going to be here till the kids are off to college. And um, yeah, and I think I, I met a lot of um, retired people as well who are on limited budgets. Um, many people have lived here for decades. And I think that was just a little point that I wanted to add on um, when Maria was speaking about, you know, you see these different generations and the, the years going by. I don't think that, it, I think it's sad to lose these people who have invested so many years in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They obviously care about the neighborhood and they have invested a decade or more in the neighborhood. They're invested, but they have to leave. And I think those are the people you don't actually want to leave because they sometimes appreciate this neighborhood in a way that's perhaps even more profound than somebody who can afford a home quite easily. There's a different layer of it. So I think the appreciation and the gratitude in their life to be able to live here and send their kids to the local schools, that's not something a neighborhood should, should want to lose. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, I want to move on to some ideas uh, that I've heard each of you say, and I want to begin with Eric. You know, Eric, you talked a lot about the um, diversity in your building and your hope for seniors and youth. Can you um, share that, share those ideas with us? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I like to believe that the, the people that have been living in Chevy Chase for years, many professional, many retired, are, are very intellectual and have a lot to give the younger population. So I, I would like to see some type of mechanism or avenue where there's more co-mingling between our elders and our youth. I think that would be really good for Chevy Chase, really good. Because uh, if, 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 if I'm not mistaken, I mean, Chevy Chase, it's a lot of people that are accomplished. So I think that it's only fair for the youth and the elders, for the elders to be able to give that to the youth. I, I think that's important. I think that's one of the most important uh, uh, things in the whole planning process, some type of mechanism or avenue where that can take place. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And uh, 
Christina, you talked about um, in the chat, uh, someone said, Christina mentioned she would like to see more things on Connecticut Avenue that we are all looking for. I would appreciate it if she elaborated on what she's looking for in the neighborhood. And I know you and I have spoken about that. And maybe you can share some of your thoughts briefly before I go to Maria. Mm -hmm. So um, I worked in um, a lot of retail and events and PR in Europe. And so I was involved with, um, and I, through my living experiences, have seen a lot of redevelopment of neighborhoods. And it's very interesting to be able to see how can you revitalize a neighborhood? And I think these small businesses are really key. And I'll use a word that we were talking, I was suggesting earlier is charm. Mm -hmm. So charm is really an authenticity with a, a vibrant energy, right? And I think that the small businesses in this area, it's, it's really very beautiful. It's got a lot more charm than certain other areas of DC. Um, you look at the Avalon, people come from a di different parts of the city just to experience the charm of it. And I think right now, what I've noticed in three years, the amount of, of storefronts that are empty for three years, <laughs> you know? And what if we had some pop-up shops? You know, I work with a lot of startup founders. There's a lot of micro entrepreneurs out there. And they are really looking for opportunities to develop their business, their skills, to meet people, to get feedback. What if we could take one of these spaces and break it up one Saturday and Sunday and allow these local micro entrepreneurs to get a feel like, is my product good, you know, and to allow people in this neighborhood to participate in allowing these entrepreneurs to, to grow. But I also think. Um, a lot of the, the restaurants are, can be expensive for people on limited incomes. And I think another thing kind of picking from other cities is just a simple cafe. Like you have a lot in Adams Morgan, you know, it's just go get a piece of cake and a coffee or even just a coffee, but with an energy that's really welcoming and warm, and maybe they've got some music going on, but welcome for all ages, but a little bit more engaging, um, a little bit more committed to the neighborhood as a lot of these businesses are, but we need to bring in more people in order for these small businesses to be sustainable, even pre-COVID. Um, they had a lot of difficulties. So I think one thing to keep in common is we want to keep this great neighborhood going, but we also need to think how can we support the small businesses and bring people enough people in from the other parts of DC to give them the funds that they can continue. So I think it's combining when I say all the things that we want to see. It'd be nice to have a little bit more cafe choice, a um, little bit more variety in the prices to eat out, um, more businesses, a different variety. I always find myself running to other neighborhoods for a lot of things. And I'm sure the small businesses would like more business. Thank you for that. Um, thank you so much. Um, Maria, you and I spoke about um, you spend a lot of time in Starbucks <laughs> and you meet a lot of yes. people. You know, yep. You've met a lot of people there from the neighborhood, um, but also about, um, you know, we spoke about uh, the uh, future modernization of the public library and the community center and sort of that uh, adding a civic core there. Do you have ideas for that um, that you want to share about that? Well, I, you know, I think we just need to reach out more. I told you my son enjoyed the, um, community center and up, up the street with um, Miss Martin, you know, and I just don't feel that the kids do that anymore. You know, I mean, I used to hear this one guy with his basketball and I knew it was seven o'clock when I heard that basketball and he'd be coming home, but I don't hear that anymore. I don't hear that energy and that mode. And so maybe the COVID just has to blow over and maybe the, you know, the diner is gone. So we don't have anybody talking about the diner anymore. You know, we know person's right that we do need to get it where um, we need to have 
more things where we know the people. Like I knew Rob. I knew when I went to go get a bagel, I knew Rob. I knew, I know Chris now from Blue 44. And so you just need to know the people that own the businesses and not get it to the point where we don't know each other and they don't feel they're part of our community. And so they reach out to us a little more. Like I said, I've been living here a long time. So I do get to know everybody, but I feel that the younger group of people aren't getting that like I am. Thank you for so that. So I think definitely we need to go and somehow reach out, maybe have a November day, maybe have something where we're saying it's not about, you know, a religion thing. It's not about Christmas. And it's just here's our day and we're going to go out there and you get to set up your table and you get to show your wares or you get to say, here's things I can offer you. Here's things I can train you to do. Things like that where we can stay a community. That's really nice. And I think some of those ideas we could probably share with Robert Gordon at the Chevy Chase Citizens Association, who just put together the big Chevy Chase Day on September 18th, which is a big deal, but he's already thinking about next year. So let's make sure that he hears some of your ideas. Um, I like to, um, there's, a, there's a question in the chat uh, by Alex Crefis, who's the, uh, he's leading the Chevy Chase Main Street program here. And he says, thank you to all the participants. In addition to, um, I guess Stuart's question, which which I haven't, I'm going to ask in a second. Um, I'd be interested in hearing from the panelists how far from their homes they consider walking distance. Uh, what portions of the area feel accessible and which feel less accessible? And I'd like Eric to comment on this first. Can you repeat that? It kind of it kind of went out on me a little bit. Okay. Um, they want he. he Alex would like to hear from the panelists how far from their homes, so where you live, um, uh, they consider walking distance. What portions of the area feel accessible and which feel less accessible? So you, you, you mentioned your daughter loved living there because she could walk everywhere. Yeah. Um, if you have an answer, answer if you don't, you could pass. Um, okay. Well, for me, actually, I like I, I walked up and down Connecticut Avenue for, for exercise. So the grocery stores, um, CVS, I like, I got a, you know, a, a UPS, I got a um, post office. So everything's accessible. And, 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 and outside of the walking, the, the, the transportation is, is because the, the, the bus drops me right off. Oh. Yeah. He got cut yes. off. Okay. Um, how about you, Maria? When he comes back, he could finish. Um, well, my walking distance is all the way down to Van Ness because I got to get my cleaning and I walk back up. And of course, you know, it's nothing like being able to walk to Friendship Heights, you know, when I have to go out and go to the um, Sh Sh Shady Grove. So that to me is my walking distance. Sometimes I've had to walk all the way down the Cleveland Park, but I don't do that that often. I guess I must be getting old, but um, I still walk down to Van Ness and into okay. Friendship Heights. And of course, up there to the circle, I still walk up to the circle. Okay. And Christine, do you want to answer it or should I go on to the next um, question? Actually, I got a slightly different point of view on that. I guess mm -hmm. me having lived in Europe, I bike everywhere. So for me, I'm very often walking down to like um, all the way down to Van Ness, like Maria said. So I'm up and down, um, but I ride my bike all over DC. So if it's not raining, I easily bike down to K Street and back. So a lot of times if it's raining or I'm really tired, I'll just pop my bike on the on the bus. And um, there's not many of us who do that. Both my kids do it. They bike to school often, and if they need to, they pop their bike on the front and they can pick it up by themselves and put it on. So I'm really pro biking. I think it's, um, I love walking, but sometimes I'm in a hurry. And so I'd say sometimes people in the neighborhood kind of laugh if I'm going up, you know, a little bit further up by Western. Um, yeah, I take my bike. It's fast, you know, and I get a little bit of air and I have my baskets with my flowers on it. So I, I put my groceries in it and everything. And I, yeah, it's a little funny. Um, but I, yeah, I think biking is a really, really great alternative. Um, okay, so thank you. I'm going to go five more minutes answering 
asking some of the questions that are in the Q&A. And then those who are in attendance, some of them do live in the apartment building, so maybe they want to just introduce themselves. I don't know how many. If you are, um, you should just put it in the chat that you are, and then we could have you introduce yourself and maybe add a few, uh, a few of your um, the challenges that you might face, things that you might change. Um, it would be nice to have that. But here's a question for you, Christina, uh, per your comments. Do you feel that ownership should be a definite part of the mix within housing growth decisions? Absolutely. Um, as I was kind of pointing out before, is I think, um, you know, you might come here because you got lucky or you don't really know about it, but maybe there is an opportunity and you grabbed it. And then with time, you become really part of the community here and engaged. And I think the real ultimate commitment is being able to own something. And that's a really true way of, of increasing the diversity is ownership. And that's really should be the ultimate goal because some of us, you know, it's, it's hard to own something, but that is a deep commitment. And those people are really engaged in making their community the best that they can. So I, I think that, yes, it, it, ownership should be a very important part. It's a serious commitment. And I think that's truly, um, true diversity is ownership of homes. Okay. And maybe I could ask Eric the same question. Eric, do you feel that ownership should be a definite part of the mix within housing growth decisions? Now that you're back. Absolutely. I, I mean, honestly, I would love home ownership in that area. It, it definitely needs to be a part. It, and it need, I think it needs to be a priority. I mean, the, the area is great, but for, for someone like myself or the other panelists to be able to have home ownership and, and, and start to build a little generational wealth in an area as nice as Chevy Chase, absolutely. And, and, and that should be part of the plan. The mayor and the city council, everybody, you know, should, should uh, join forces for places like uh, Chevy Chase to bring a little diversity. And as I mentioned to you, Connie, it works both ways. Those that do come to Chevy Chase got to uh, 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 respect and appreciate the people that live there as well. So we can all accept and appreciate each other. You know, the city's growing, you know, it's, 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 it's diverse. I live in a diverse building now. So I, I would like to see more diversity and home ownership in Chevy Chase, definitely. Thank you. And you also, Eric, said to me that um, about building affordable housing units, you said that along with that comes uh, about the um, the feeling of belonging. Can you can you expand on that yeah. a little? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, myself or someone. So Eric, from, uh, Eric, why don't you start again because from, we've from, lost from Northeast. You know. Yeah. So Eric, why don't you start that you uh, your now? response? Yes, start your response again because we've we missed several words and what you're saying is important. Okay. Um. Yes. Um. I, I'll use my seven example and someone from like Northeast or Southeast DC, um, coming up to Chevy Chase. I mean, you know, we it, it, we can feel out of place. We can feel a little bit uncomfortable, but I think that those that's living in Chevy Chase could make a concerted effort to make us feel comfortable, to make us, you know, feel that we belong in that area. Because it, it, DC is diverse. DC is diverse and we can't, we can't get around that. Yes, we have our um, 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 prejudices or whatnot, or, you know, um, the biases, but we all human. And I think that, and I can't say this enough. I think that the people that live there have so much to give in terms of their intellectual capacity. Someone like myself, I would love that, be living in an area like that and learn from the people that's been living there. I would love it. I would relish that opportunity. Thank you so much for that. And Maria, do you want to say anything about, um, do you feel that ownership should be a definite part of the mix within housing growth decisions? Because you made a comment earlier that you said, so maybe you could expand on your comment earlier and you're muted. So you have to unmute. 
I think that as part of life, you need to have assets. And I don't think that anybody should be not denied the opportunity to have a home in a nice neighborhood. And I just believe that we shouldn't deny our children that opportunity to have assets so they can have a legacy to leave behind to their children as well. Thank you for that. Um, here's another question. Uh, are there any particular problems or improvements within your apartment that might be better addressed by the small area plan process? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Mm -hmm. and, after, and then I'd like to go broader, back to broader <laughs> outside of your apartment. Um, I'd like to say, I don't think so. I mean, um, there was one situation that, that might come up in the future and kind of looking at all the apartments in the Garfield and kind of really getting a lay of the land. Like how are these apartments, how many one bedrooms, how many studios? I don't know if this is possible, but it seems like there are actually quite a few empty apartments. Many apartments have been empty for a considerable amount of time. Now, that's interesting on its own, but would it be possible to join apartments if there's a vacancy? Is it possible to create a three bedroom or join two one bedrooms? I'm not sure. I don't know what that would look like. That's not my expertise, but I think that's a question. And I also think the other thing kind of a little bit tangential is you see in other parts of DC that a lot of developers are buying homes for example, over by Georgia and so forth, and they're putting two or three condos in there, right? And so yeah. they're building it upwards a little bit. They might build out a little in the back, but they're being very clever about the use of space that was originally one home. So I, and those homes are pretty affordable and they're pretty swanky, right? They, these guys know what they're doing. Um, so I think maybe that's something to also consider. The homes that are here, can we, divide them into two or three, because some of them are really big. Um, so I don't know, that's kind of a little bit. Is there a way of rethinking the spaces that already exist, kind of? Um, and along with that question, Commissioner Higgins um, uh, is in the chat and he's asking, ownership implies either a condo arrangement or a cooperative versus renting in a multiple occupancy in a multi-story building. Um, how, how, what's your reaction as a panelist about that? When you said a home ownership, are you thinking single family home or are you thinking of, of um, more uh, condo buildings, cooperatives? Single family. Single family, I, okay. Yeah, single family home with a basement, you know, and things of that nature, like, a, you know, a traditional home. Yeah, okay. I would say single family detached. Okay. So, and how I'm about you? The same, I'm thinking same. the same thing too. Single family home, basement, yard. Okay. I think that's like the dream, right? That's. Yeah, that's I, the dream. I mean, and I wanted to tag on to Maria's comment earlier is that this owning a home thing, it's, it's not just about legacy, it's also about um, self confidence, it's also about stability. Um, the feeling that you have, this is a home, we bought it, we know where we're going to live for the next X amount of time until we decide to sell it, right? And I think that's really something that a lot of people don't think, it doesn't occur to them when you're in a limited income. Sometimes you have no idea where you're going to be living in three months, six months, a year, you don't know. And the effect on children is really intense. And that affects their school grades and their school grades affect their future professional opportunities. So that home ownership isn't just about the great legacy, that's important, but it's also about the here and now, right? Self-confidence and so forth. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to, Jamie Butler asks, has asked a question a few minutes ago. Does Eric know, and I think Eric was trying to type this answer, does Eric know if all the affordable units in his building are rented? 
I live close to his building and it seems that it has the most diverse tenants in our neighborhood. Do the panelists think that is accurate? So I don't know if Eric knows the answer to that question, yeah, but yeah, Eric, I, if you I, do. I think they're all rented. I think they're all rented. Okay. Yeah, I don't think any like uh, like home ownership within that. I think they're all rented. Okay. Uh, Peter, uh, I think you have something you want to say. You're shaking your finger, so why don't you <laughs> jump right in? Eric, I'm a commissioner with uh, Commissioner Chang. Uh, I think the question isn't whether they're owned or they're rented. There's a con <clears throat> Some of us have a concern that <clears throat> they put aside uh, uh, units uh, in the building to be affordable, but they didn't get rented. Do you have a sense about that? Oh. Uh, it's, well, you, you don't, it's fine with, I mean. You, well, you, I, no, I'm trying to think, I, well, I know, I know, you know, it, I don't know, you know, who actually, who, who else um, won the inclusionary zoning, but I think a lot of the apartments, because they have them like in a straight line going up, the one that's affordable. And I think there are some people living in them, renting them, so I, I don't, I don't think. Okay, oh, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, Connie, just okay. if there's time for questions from the commissioners. I have a few, but I mean, uh, uh, prioritize the, the public first. Okay, yeah, that's what I was trying to do is just to, to get through here. Um, I think Jerry's question I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna ask later uh, as a, uh, and let's see, there's another, um, Okay, there are there are a few people in the audience, Jeff Norman being one who lives in Garfield too, who wanted to share a little bit. And um, I think I could have Peter first though. Why don't you ask your questions? You've been very patient and uh, Commissioner Gore, Commissioner Gosselin, if you'd like to ask your question, let's continue before we switch over to, to Jeff. And I never meant for this to end exactly at eight. So I hope people will hang on uh, because we have three guests and there's a lot to talk about. So um, hopefully we'll, be, we'll end by eight, 10, eight, 15, not, not much longer. Um, Peter, uh, Commissioner Gosselin, please. All three of you, uh, the, uh, the commissioners, a lot of us have concerns about um, two aspects of building up this community. One is that the schools be adequate to take, the schools which are already at capacity be adequate to take a new uh, injection of population here. And the second is, has to do with roads. So the first question is, has to do with roads. How do you get to the work you do? And that's a hard question, but because of the pandemic, but how did you get to the work you did before we got into this mess? And, um, and uh, how much did you depend uh, 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 on public transportation? I depend solely on transportation. I walked up to Chevy Chase and I caught the number one um, Montgomery bus or the, or the um, DC um, bus to Silver Spring where I work. Christina? Um, like I said, I bike pretty much everywhere that I can. Um, I do take public transportation, um, but I find it kind of nightmarish. It, you, <laughs> never, you never know when it's gonna come. My kids don't even bother to take it to school. It's faster to walk to Wilson or Dio. I think um, that's something I'm really concerned about. Um, people, a lot of people in the neighborhood who have cars, they say they won't do it because the buses never come. And um, what was it? You had another question. It was the roads and the, the schools. Let me just oh. ask Eric about how he gets to work, and then let me switch back to schools. Eric, Eric. Um, yeah, um, I, I I used to ride the L two when I worked in Washington D.C. The L two to the train. Now I'm working in Maryland, so I I I, I either catch the L two to uh, Van Ness and hop on the train, or I'll just walk to Friendship Heights, get some fresh air. So yeah, I definitely use public transportation. So the other question I'll ask it really quickly is, all three of you have you told the story about how you got here. And, and certainly with Maria, it has to do both with your long history here, but also the schools. But I wonder for uh, you, Christina and Eric, talking to other people in the building, how much is, how important uh, uh, is the quality of schools here in attracting people to, to the buildings you live in? Well, for me, 
I picked the school for my kids before I picked anything else. But I know that there's a lot of kids that go to Deal and Wilson who are coming from across town, um, some of them quite far, but the schools are overcrowded already. So, I mean, at a certain point, whether you add more children to this neighborhood or not, it's gonna have to be addressed. And I mean, that's so, you, you're gonna have to break it in. You know, deal is what, a thousand kids? That's not like normal for, for a middle school. You're gonna have to break it and then you can welcome more kids, right? Yeah. Okay, if you have a chance for another question, I have a very simple question about. Uh, okay, let me move to, uh, did, I don't know if Eric wanted to respond, and if he doesn't, it's okay, Eric, I could. I, I, I echo what Christina say. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, excellent. Okay, Commissioner Gore, you have a question. Your hand is raised. There we go. I had a okay. We held our breath. We held our breath. <laughs> I couldn't get my mouse to uh, work. <laughs> I really actually don't have a question. I have a um a comment, and my comment is that I cannot tell all the panelists how grateful I am to have you guys on this presentation and to hear your voices. I live in a Hawthorne section which is as far to Oregon Avenue as you could probably get. Um, homeowner, and I think most of the people that I see come into the ANC meetings, participating in our task forces, you know, they, we all kind of have the same voice. And um, you guys are a very diverse panel. I love all of you all, your comments. And I love that you guys are showing um, that Chevy Chase is a diverse community. And that is like so critically important. I think sometimes, and I was actually talking to um, a, a lady this afternoon on senior issues. And we were talking about how sometimes in, you know, what's traditionally thought of as Ward 3 Chevy Chase um, in the broader areas, um, sometimes people don't recognize the issues that we have, you know, whether it's seniors that are um, food insecure, people that depend on public transportation. We have a whole community of people that live in apartments, you know, not the big houses and, you know, that you traditionally think about in Chevy Chase. And it, I cannot tell you how critical it is to keep your voices in this Chevy Chase conversation, this community belongs to all of us, regardless of who we are, regardless of where we live. Um, so I'm just saying, I am so happy uh, to hear you guys on the panel. And I hope to see you at ANC meetings. I wanna hear about the issues that are going on. I told Maria this, cause she's on the task force with me. Um, you know, these are things that we need to hear about. We need to hear your perspective. So I'm just really grateful to have you guys as uh, participants on this panel. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you for that, Commissioner Gore. We're all now very happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is important, you know, uh, earlier today, Peter Lynch, who's an attendee, asked Erkin, um, do we know how many people live in the apartment buildings and how many people are single family home um, occupants basically and uh in one of the presentations that were given and maybe eric can share that link um it, it our housing stock in this area is 65 percent is multi uh multi-unit building so it's the apartment buildings and 35 percent is single family homes but the land that they occupy is reversed it's like 73 percent is single family homes but the population across the two um is um is the same because the apartment buildings it's the studios and one bedrooms whereas homes there's more so they kind of even out and therefore uh going back to what commissioner gore was saying your voices really matter and i think this is why we set up the panel because we want to hear from you it's not that it's not that there's many of you so you're and you're not necessarily even representative of everyone but you are you are in that in that population of residents who live there and so we want to know your story we want to hear about your story we want to know your ideas so thank you so much um for that and thank you peter lynch in the um in the attendee list so okay 
I, I think I'd like to bring Jeff Norman up. Jeff, I'm going to give you, a, you know, one or two minutes just to share your story. Maybe then questions will be generated, but I have to figure out how to elevate you as I go. Um, and maybe, let's see, maybe let me try to get to you and elevate you. Um, and while I'm doing that, I think we should think about uh, Jerry Mallet's question, which is, what would you change if you could change anything about the Chevy Chase area? So don't answer it now. Let me elevate Jeff. See if I, you know, usually, there it is. And I don't know how to elevate him. Commissioner Gore, you're always the one doing it. And I'm the only host here. So how do I get him to speak? Oh, so go to the oh, participant. Oh, I could just, yeah, I could just, I could allow to talk. So there he's right up there. That's it. I thought it was like elevate to panelists or something, you know, more it complicated. Is. Okay, it is. Okay, yeah. Jeff, do you want to, um, do you want to turn on your video so we could see you? It would be nice. Uh, oh, I can't seem to find it. Um. It's on the bottom bottom uh, that says uh, under, right by mute and stop video. Uh, I think you can say. I think you can. Well, open. there's mute. And and I don't see. Huh. OK, well, OK, so please, you, you wanted to share that you're also. Um, on the well, I'm also a resident so of the Garfield. Right. As Christina is and. Uh, I've lived there over 30 years, and I used to be president, and I'm still on the, the board of directors. And I own my apartment, and I guess in the short time that I have, one thing I'd like to raise is the extraordinarily high cost of housing in Chevy Chase. The single family houses are almost all over a million dollars. And I think, in the U.S. as a whole, the average house is about 200000 But this is a very, very expensive neighborhood. Even my one-bedroom condo is, is now worth about 290000 and And the two bedrooms, I think some of them are up in, in the $400,000 category. So this severely limits people who want to move here and who want to, and who want to own something. And I think that's a problem. I, I think it might be partially alleviated if we had some additional condos. The neighborhood is pretty much built up, but there are a few areas where some additional condos could go in. The site of the library and the community center is supposed to be redeveloped. And you could have something with uh, uh, with perhaps the library and the community center on the first floor and condos above. And uh, there are a few other areas, the area that's covered by the small area plan, for example, allows uh, housing up to five stories. And I think it would help if some of those uh, became apartments, assuming the owners want to want to sell that land. There are some of these stores that are vacant. Uh, if the owners want to sell them and develop them as condos or even rentals, that might be a very good thing to bring some more people into the neighborhood. So that's my comment. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that. Um, do, do the panelists want to react? Anyone want to? react to that well i think adding I mean, um i think adding space over there with the um library and community center is and having buildings over top and the, some kind of would be great and in in the in the chat um Carl Lankowski, who is the president of the Historic Chevy Chase DC, he has a link to a talk that's coming up on October 6th. I hope that everyone on this call will, will join that talk. Um, 
Board 3 Vision is giving a presentation on their vision of Chevy Chase DC. And, and some of it includes affordable housing um, on that campus and elsewhere. So that's something that we could all um, participate in and then talk about. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we really appreciate your comments. And, um, and you, you are one of the longtime residents, just like Maria. I don't know if you guys ever met in Starbucks, but Maria meets a lot of people there. <laughs> and that's why I wanted your video to turn on so that she would know that that's Jeff next time she saw you. No, no, we, we, we haven't met, but uh, one of the residents of the Lorraine is one of our front desk clerks. His name oh. is Seth. He's a young man. Oh, okay, yes, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I, 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 I put Eric and Jamie up here. I'm so sorry. Let me bring you down. Okay. So um, let's, while I try to figure that out, can, can someone um, answer, whoever would like to go first, what would you change if you could change anything about the Chevy Chase area? I think um, more diversity in, in, in single family home ownership. I know it's a gigantic task, but it's not an impossible task because I'm quite certain Maria and Chris, you know, for obvious reasons, um, would love to uh, own a single family home. So that's that's yeah. one of the things that I would like to change. Okay. I agree with Eric. Um, being able to afford a house would be great up here. Um, I think for me, I definitely agree with that. I think that um, the duplexes and triplexes, condos, that could also be very interesting. But I would say it's a little bit longer term. That's going to take a little bit of time. But I would say in the like immediate future, I would really like to see um, more businesses in our neighborhood. Um, to me, that's that's really important is um, to have a, a variety of businesses. I don't I like to spend my money in this neighborhood. Right. And I really like going to the shops here. I feel like there's a connection and the, the businesses kind of know us and it's very friendly and it feels like a small town. Um, but I, I really think um, providing a variety other alternatives for cafes or little shops. Um, I think that would also bring people from other parts like Cleveland Park up here. And that would really help um, this area economically. And it would also bring it some vitality. Um, my teenagers are a little bored. So they have to go to Tenley Town or, or you know, somewhere like that. And I, I think there are a lot of teenagers in this neighborhood, even if we don't see them, it's probably because they're running off to a different neighborhood. So there's a lot of kids playing basketball at the Livingston Park every day. So community center, um, more for teens. That, that's another thing that I'd love to see. Yes. You did mention that, Christina, that there's a lack, uh, there's a lot of attention paid to older and younger. Uh, but not really for the teen, that middle crowd of people, right? Um, all right, I'd like to, I think we're going to wrap up. Uh, I think Commissioner Gosselin had his hand up, but then your hand went down. Would you like to ask, you had that that short question you wanted to ask, so why don't you go? The question more immediately besides, be, before we build any buildings, I, 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 I represent the district that has more apartment buildings and more multifamily than any of the other districts. And I, I wonder if there's a way, can you imagine ways, suggest ways that we could get single family residents and apartment dwellers and condo dwellers to talk to each other more? So I'm in the interesting position of I'm actually living in the Kenmore, but I have a single family house that has had 25 years of wreckage from kids uh, done to it and it's being repaired now. Um, uh, and, but the only place that I interact with um, people who are living in the multifamily buildings, uh, the big buildings, is parking. So, you know, you run into people parking on Chevy Chase Parkway. I, I wonder, I, you know, if I did a 533 or uh, uh, Chevy Chase Parkway block party, would people come, Eric? 
I, I mean, I, I'm looking for suggestions. Hey, hey that, that, that would be, uh, Peter, that would be a great idea. And that's what I was talking to Connie about. Um, I, I think it's, it, it needs to be that engagement. And what, what, what would have to occur, Peter, in these, in, in these uh, multifamily complexes is that we would have to get the word out. Yeah. So to let people know that, you know, we have this going on and we have that going on and, you know, encourage, encourage the um, people that run the building and own the building. They have a responsibility as well. You know, you can't just uh, park an apartment building or multifamily building there and then, you know, just collect rent. You're, you know, you have a social responsibility to the community to try to bridge those gaps, you know, try to, you know, reach out to them and ask them, you know, well, would y'all be willing to sponsor this between two or three separate, um, two or three separate complexes that have a special day? Well, so that I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you and, and um, to Maria and to Christina. I mean, one of the problems I realized when I was running uh, for office and leafleted, I leaflet every single house. I've done it again and again and again. In the buildings, all you can do is dump stuff in the front lot. I mean, they don't let you go around. And so um, it's, it's just, it's a difficult, it's, it's like, it's hard to figure out how to get these two worlds to be more integrated. Uh, it's just difficult uh, 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 from the point of view of a, a usually single family house owner. Um, it, it's, uh, so if you have any ideas, I'm all ears. Yeah. I would say food, yeah. <laughs> anything with food, because that's what yeah. everybody shares in common. Yeah, I think Absolutely. block parties, I would love to see block parties. Anything with food and music, it doesn't have to be, you know, a total blowout, but I think that's where <laughs> human beings bond, right? And I think like we have these great parks, you know, why can't we have kind of a little celebration, you know, from time to time. Also, I'm, you know, again, mentioning Europe is we have Christmas markets and, you know, we could winter markets or spring Easter markets, you know, to be able to have some stands on, on the boulevard and, you know, again, the micro businesses, but really give an ambiance, right? Really give an ambiance of warmth and welcoming and, people naturally start speaking to each other. And I think things like pubs and, you know, cafes, Starbucks, I walk by there every day and it's super popular. People really connect there, but it would be nice to have something that's not a chain, <laughs> you yeah. know? So I think food, drinking, a little bit of music, those are really great ways of meeting people outside of your usual group. I would be um, remiss not to mention that in the next few Saturdays, uh, ANC commissioners are going to be at the farmer's market. So I really do encourage uh, people to go out there. I mean, that's that's there every Saturday from like eight to one or something like that. And it's a great way to meet more neighbors. Um, it's hard to just walk up to someone and introduce yourselves, but maybe this is one way for commissioners uh, to be able to talk to apartment dwellers more. And then uh, maybe we have more ideas. I love Maria's idea earlier about like a November party, but like we don't need to, we could celebrate, you know, and just have um, a, a get together that's beyond just Chevy Chase Day, that one event. Um, so I would like to wrap up by asking the panelists, is there anything that you were not asked or anything that really jumped out at you that you, f you really want to emphasize um, as a sort of departing word? Well, I, I just want to <laughs> go ahead, Eric. I just want to make sure that um, everybody's voices get heard in an equitable way, and that um, the, the the small area plan that it it, it 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 put equity and diversity at the forefront. Okay. I just want to let everybody know that um, the key thing is that we don't own the space that we live in. So it's real hard to do things and to plan things. I've been living in my apartment uh, building for a very long time. And we just got a new owner um, a few years back and they pretty much halted a whole lot of stuff we used to do. So we used to have block parties, we used to have cookouts, we used to have a whole bunch of stuff they told us we could no longer do. So it would um, open up if we could talk to the people who do own our buildings to let them know 
that we need to be able to do things to keep us, you know, as a community. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, the, these housing opportunities is really important. And like I said before, I think that developing um, the retail, um, kind of the Connecticut, the, the opportunities to connect outside of our homes, I think is, is very important too in this middle time, you know, while we find solutions for the housing. I think a lot of bonding and communication can happen if we have more places where we can actually converse mm -hmm. in non-formal settings. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. I do want to just uh, give a plug to the Office of Planning where they have a draft vision and goals document. This is the vision goals for the Chevy Chase small area plan. They're open to feedback until October 8th. And so I believe Erican has put it in the chat, the link. Um, please look at the link and I will just, just go to publicinput.com forward slash Chevy Chase. And it's the yellow document. And um, it's six themes. Uh, and this is a document that uh, is a culmination of several of their engagements over the spring. And so um, each of this, the themes, if you go online, you have a chance to comment. And uh, having um, more feedback on that, that helps the next phase, which will be later, I, I think later this fall, uh, where we'll have a design charrette. That means the community and the planners will get together and have conversations um, on the, uh, not just the, the why and the but, uh, what, and going to the where, you know, more details. Um, so please remember to do that for October 8th. And then October 6th, I mentioned already, there's that talk that HCC, um, Chevy Chase, Historic Chevy Chase DC is, is putting together. Okay, so um, I'm going to slowly end this. Uh, I call it, I call it an end at 817. I'm going to stop the recording. I want to thank the panelists. I actually most enjoy talking to each of you separately, and I really enjoyed tonight. So thank you so much for giving us of your time. And I think some of the ideas of how we can integrate more, we need to follow up on, and I hope that we can do that. And the commission, we can talk about that. So thank you so much. I'm gonna end the recording, and if people would like to say- Thank you yes, for listening. Thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you for listening. <laughs> We appreciate the opportunity. It's yes. it's really great to be heard and considered. Thank you. Maria, anything else? Eric, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate the platform tonight. Thank you, Eric, especially to you because you're calling in from New York City. Thank you so much and safe travels home. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. All right.